Um, I, uh, I, I believe that uh, 2023 is going to be the up year. I believe this year that things are going to happen in our lives. For those, uh, yes, I'm not saying there won't be trials, there won't be tests. I'm not saying there will not be difficulties. Because I do believe that 2023 there will be difficulties. There will be reasons to lose faith. There will be things that will cause uh, us to take step backwards even. I believe that the enemy will throw everything he has plus the kitchen sink at us, right? I, I do. I believe that it's not going to be a simple year. It's going to be the year of a new level. A new place in God. Hopefully starting spiritually. And that's what I'm going to deal with a little bit today. Spiritually, we've got to be in the new place in order to be able to handle the future plans God has for us. And it is important for us to be willing to grow spiritually and go up to where God wants us to be. Living the up life at great life is going to include what I'm going to talk about today. And that is going to be, it is time for a tune-up. Tune-ups are important. How many know tune-ups are important? I think sometimes when you think about uh, tune-up, there are uh, tune-ups that happen with those kind of tools, right? There's tune-ups that are about the car. It used to be we did more tuning up cars than we do today. But to cars still tune themselves up is the thing. The computer checks things. If there's a problem, it sends a code. It tells you it's time to you know, change oil. It tells you it's time for some service. And you go and you find out one of the fuel injectors is messed up. Something's not flowing like it could. One of the sensors aren't working right. We know all these things. And it kind of electronically tells you that. It used to be when I was young, I would have to go. And with my dad sometimes, and we would tune a car. We'd pull out the spark plugs, right? We'd change the wires. We'd change the cap and the rotor. Yes, I know all of that stuff. I know it's hard for you to believe it, right? And we would change out those things. Uh, and sometimes it was more of uh, uh, different things. Nowadays, you know, you got to give a car a tune-up. you got to tune it up. Uh, not necessarily tune it up in the sense of cap and rotor and spark plugs and wires. But as far as even like things that get broken, the, 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 the alternator and the regulator and the batteries go bad. And you got to <clears throat> know what's wrong and you got to fix them. Why? So the car will run good. Organizations need tune-ups. Thank you. Organizations need tune-ups, right? They have to tune some stuff up. People get, uh, you know, out of practice. They don't do what they're supposed to do. They don't keep doing the jobs. They don't clean like they're supposed to clean. They don't finish jobs like they're supposed to finish them, right? They start falling short. They don't show up when they're supposed to show up. Well, that sounds like a church. <laughs> People kind of get out of practice of doing things that they should do, right? And then that's okay. And so we got to get together. We do a tune-up and, and we say, you know what? It's time to, to get back to the practices that you're supposed to be doing in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of tune-ups, but you know what? I believe even sometimes, you know, that's why that we talk about uh, New Year's resolutions. I look at New Year's resolutions kind of like the, the plan for a tune-up. You know, I want to I wanna be skinny. So you start tuning things up, right? we got to tune up uh, this, our, our life a little bit so that it, it, it lends itself to the possibility of losing weight, of being in shape, of, of eat the right things, exercise, uh, you know, take care, get enough sleep, right? Do what you're supposed to do to, to make things more right in your physical body so that you look. It's a tune-up. Emotionally, even, people go see counselors and psychiatrists and and, and those kind of things. What? To get a mental or an emotional tune-up, right? I got to hear them. Someone's got to tell me. You got to quit thinking that way. Okay, you got to let that go. You need to change that. You need to be healed from that. You know, you need to decide, is it worth to hold on to that stuff? Or do you want a new future? How are you going to move forward? Right? It's a tune-up. But I believe that really what God is wanting us to focus on is to consistently realize that we consistently need to evaluate and tune up our spiritual lives. A spiritual tune-up. And over the months and, 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 and even the years in your life that are in the future... I want you to remember this message today. Why? Because I believe that when you start 
when, you're, when your engine starts running rough and wrong and you find yourself not doing the things you should be doing and you find your life falling apart and all of a sudden you're broke down on the side of the road of life. Have you ever been broke down on the side of the road in your car? I have plenty of times. I've been broke down plenty of times. My first revival I ever went to preach, I broke down three times before I got to that place I was supposed to preach. I was two hours late. They still called me up there and had me preach. They were waiting for me. I was up by Mount Hood in the middle of the snow, chased by dogs, chased by robbers. It's a great story now. I fell... In a frozen river. How do you fall into a frozen river, preacher? Because I was trying to get some water to dilute the gas that I'd poured all over my engine, thinking it would blow up if I lit it with all that gas on there. <laughs> it's true, believe me. I've been broke down on the side of the road. But I tell you what, I've also spiritually been broke down on the side of the road of life. I've had things happen that completely devastated me and I was a mess in my life and I was lost in my life and I was thinking the wrong things in my life. I was not remembering the things that I knew. I was not doing the things I knew to do, but I was, I was just finding, I wasn't necessarily out sinning like a, uh, like a, I guess, I don't know, you don't know if you can sin like a seller. I know you can cuss like a seller, but anyway. <laughs> my point is, I was sinning and I wasn't necessarily sinning like that. I wasn't necessarily that far away. But I spiritually was not keeping myself where I needed to be. And therefore, I was finding myself emotionally and physically and spiritually unable to handle the things I was going through in the right way. And what I want to do is I want to give you the tools. I want to give you the road map. To where that you can stay where you need to be in God. And if you happen to find yourself broke down in the side of the road of life, then you'll know what to do to get it back on the track. How many believe that's possible? Yeah. Or if you find yourself sputtering along, I call it living in the maze of mediocrity, <clears throat> going around the same loop, doing the same things you always did, getting the same results you always got. You just keep doing it and you're not going anywhere forward. What God has for you. God has not intended your life to be mundane. God has not intended your life to be normal. God has not intended your life to be messed up. God has not intended for any of that. He has plans for you. Plans for you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So everything is equalized by the prosperity of your spiritual man will influence your own physical life. The spiritual man will fit will, will they affect even where you're going in your dreams and your plans. It all comes down to your spiritual life. Are you tuned up? Are you running on all whatever amount of cylinders and going where God wants you to go? Amen? Amen. If you're going to live the up life, it's not just going to happen because everybody who walks in the room is immediately going to get the up life and great life. That's not what we're saying. We're saying for you that are willing to surrender to God in your life and do the things God's called you to do, to put aside some of that other stuff. Yeah, it takes, it takes setting stuff aside to be in God's house every Sunday. It takes setting stuff aside. It takes choices. It takes choices to get up early enough to have daily time with God. It takes choice, surrender from the things I want to do to things that God wants me to do. It takes surrender. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, I can go on and tell you other things. It takes surrender even to let the pain go. To forgive the person that is unforgivable and doesn't deserve to be forgiven. And they don't. They do not deserve to be forgiven for what they did to you. They do not. I didn't deserve either to be forgiven. But Jesus still forgave me. Come on. I didn't do what that person did to you. I know that. I understand that. I did not cause that kind of pain in your life. And God didn't do that to God necessarily. But the point is that I'm trying to tell you is that forgiveness is not about the person you're forgiving. Forgiveness is about you going on to what God has planned for you. Yeah. You may need to 
forgive God. You may need to forgive somebody who abused you. You may need to forgive somebody who totally destroyed you, left your life in a shambles and a wreck. I don't know. And I don't know why it's coming up again, but it did. It's not on my notes, but it come up again. <laughs> See, God has good plans for you, but he needs to do this tune-up in your life, and he needs to be able to help you accomplish this. Ephesians chapter, actually no, 3 John chapter 1. We're going to read that verse first. And uh, 3 John chapter 1. Do we got that verse up there? Or did I give you that one? I didn't give you that one. Okay, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4, <laughs> verses 9 through 16. I didn't give you that one, I know. Notice that it says, He ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. So, he's saying that, in the previous verse, talks about Jesus left heaven, come to this earth, He descended down to this dirty earth, and became Jesus, born of a virgin. We know the story. I say it often, right? So Jesus descended down to this earth, but then he also, it's saying, if he descended, then he clearly means that Christ also descended our lowly world. Verse 10. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens, so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. In other words, it's saying that Jesus left heaven, came to this earth. Why? Because he had to. The human race was in trouble. We were separated from God. We had separated from God since Adam sinned in the garden, right? You've heard me say this over and over. Why do I keep saying it? Because it's important. You're going to find out why I keep saying it in a minute. But the point is that it's important for us to understand we were broken and lost, and this world was a mess, and we were separated from God. It couldn't be in a relationship with Him anymore in the way that God wanted to be in a relationship with us. See, Jesus coming to this earth was all about he wanted that relationship with us. He wanted to spread himself to all of us, to allow all of us to have him in our heart, to allow the Holy Spirit to come eventually and lead and guide us into all truth. The point was that he left heaven, he came to this earth in order, and then after that he ascended back into heaven. But it says he did it so that he might fill the entire universe or the entire world or known world or universe with himself. The point was he wanted he wanted to fill the world with his presence. He wanted to fill every humanity with his presence. He wanted to be able to not only be in the heavenlies, but he wanted to be in here on this earth as well. All of the universe full of God, full of Jesus, full of his presence, full of his love, full of relationship. And he had a plan to get that done. And that plan began with him leaving heaven and coming to this earth. Just like us here today at Great Life Church, like Jay talked about. I believe the plan is for us not to only feel this building, Great Life Church, with, uh, with God's presence, and only to, only to touch people's lives that come inside these four walls. God has called us to leave the protection of the four walls and go into the world and to love people. Amen? Amen. Jesus the same way. He was in heaven, but he needed to be on this earth so he could share himself with the earth. Does that make sense? Yes. Same thing with us. We can't be just stuck inside the walls. We've got to get out and be good to people, be loving to people, show Jesus. In reality, since we're full of Jesus, when we go out, that is part of the process of sharing himself with the entire universe. Make sense? Amen. That's quite the picture, ain't it? I could spend some time there, but I ain't got time for that. But, so the goal was he ascended down his earth so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. His plan was to come down here then to fill his disciples. Then his disciples pass the baton on to the New Testament church. And then the New Testament church passed the baton on to the modern church, right? It's just the way it was. And the filling of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, continued throughout the universe. Let's go on. Now these are the gifts Christ gave. So he's going to go on to explain how he plans on sharing himself with the entire universe. First, he leaves heaven and he comes to this earth. Then he says, now these are the gifts that Christ gave. Now, when you heard the word gifts, immediately most people think the gifts are the gifts of the spirit, right? Maybe the gifts of the spirit, maybe the fruits of the spirit. But the gifts he gave, yes, he gave gifts of the spirit. The spirit gave those gifts. The gifts that Jesus left behind, the gifts that Jesus left behind are getting ready to be listed. And he gave the church these gifts. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. It says he left 
these gifts for the church? How is he going to make himself known to the whole world? How is he going to spread himself to the entire universe? He is going to send apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And he's going to give them as a gift to the church. Can you believe that? I'm a gift to this church. Hallelujah. <laughs> and the teachers that are in the house... You're a gift to the church. And the pastor now, you're a gift to the church. The evangelist is a gift to the church. They're gifts to the church. Believe in these last, these last days. God has not only allowed me to be a pastor and will continue to grow this in my life, but he is also, God is creating, and I'm going I'm to step out a little faith. I'm going to let you know. God has told me that I am becoming an apostle to the church. Praise God. Because I'm not leaving. That's not the point. And that's okay. It was hard for me to even speak it. But I speak it to my family first. Amen. And so the point is that God gives gifts. He gives gifts. And, and, and those gifts are the apostles. He's going to spread himself. And teachers. And then, you know, you're a gift to the church, Pastor Donnie? Amen. Amen. There comes some responsibility with that. Let's go on to verse their responsibility goes right into it. <laughs> Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work. So God gave apostles and prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers, and their responsibility, so Jesus came to the earth, he gave the gifts, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work. So it's my responsibility as the lead pastor of this church and with the help of all the other teachers, evangelists, prophets, the different ones that do those gifts, for us to what? Equip the church. To equip God's people to do his work and to continue spreading about Jesus around the world. Helping people live like Jesus. Helping people laugh, act like Jesus too. To experience the Holy Spirit in your life so you can be all that Christ has called you to be. Amen? Amen? To build, to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. See, we are the body of Christ. And my responsibility as the pastor and the other leaders of this church, bottom line is our responsibility is to build you up in Christ. To see that happen in your life. And in 2023, we want to be more focused in seeing that happen in your life. Let's go to verse 13. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. What he's saying is this will continue. Jesus came. There was a start. 30, 30, uh, his 33 years on this earth. He started and it finished. He was done. He left this earth. He ascended to heaven. He sent back the Comforter. He sent back the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is present with everybody at once. Jesus himself could only spread himself to the 12 and a few hundred thousand more, maybe at the most. 2,000, 3, I don't know how many thousand of people got to actually touch Jesus, be by Jesus, listen to Jesus' voice. But he was trapped by the human body. He was trapped. He could not share himself with the entire universe, could he? So when he said, it's expedient that I go, because when I go away, then I'm going to share myself through the bath, through the Holy Spirit. I'm going to leave the teacher. I'm going to leave the comforter. I'm going to leave the Spirit of God. Now the Spirit of God now can be the teacher to the entire universe. Hallelujah. That's good, isn't it? For all eternity. This gift is for you, for your children, for their children, and for all those who are far off. What it says in Acts chapter 2 at the very last verse. Right? So he was trying to say, we're going to spread it now. My, I hope I'm going, I, I want to go slow. Why? Because it's my job to build you up, to teach you, to give you the knowledge that you need in order to be successful. And some of you already know this and some of you don't. And you that know this want me to go slow on it because you want the ones that don't know it to know it. Can I hear an amen? Amen. <laughs> so it, it's important to see the plan. This will continue until we all come to such an unity. So when we all come into unity, when we are resurrected, when we're in heaven with the Lord, when, when this is done. So after the rapture, we go to heaven and the end time stuff that we've studied before here. But the point is that then we will come into full unity. This is where we are at in the, you want to use the word, word dispensate? This is the moment that we're in. The moment we're in is that God gave you pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, and apostles for your perfecting, for your growing, for your maturing. 
All right? You are responsible to grow. And who knows? God may even have that in your plan to be one of those. But either way, it doesn't matter. The point is we have responsibility. And this is going to continue until we all come into knowledge of God and the Son. That we will be mature in the Lord. But the process is that we should all be maturing in the Lord. I've seen sometimes where people have been in the church for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and they're less spiritually mature 30 years later than they were when they started. Now, they know how to play the game. They put on the right clothes. They talk the right talk. They talk to say the right things. They can raise their hand and shake it as good as anyone else at the exact right moment. You know what I'm talking about? But they are mean sometimes. They are judgmental sometimes. They don't have the love of Jesus in their heart sometimes. Not always. I've seen other people who have been in the church their whole life and are the most loving, kind, helpful, wise, know more scripture than anyone else in life, and they're wonderful people. Amen. That's what I want to be. Amen? You are. But this is the kind of church we are. We're the kind of church that is growing up, that we are maturing up, that we are, we are we're going to become mature in the Lord. We're going to measure up. To the full and complete standard of Christ. What is the full and complete standard of Christ? It is a complete spiritual maturity. We will be mature in the Lord. Measuring up in the full and complete standard of Christ, right? Then we will no longer be immature like children. God is calling Great Life Church and the family of Great Life Church to grow up and for us not to be children anymore. This comes through a consistent tune-up, a consistent growing up. Has anyone ever known a 30-year-old that is still a child? No point fingers. Some of you got point fingers. Don't be doing that. A couple of wives going like that. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad my wife no I'm, I'm actually not glad she's not here I wish she was <laughs> I miss her but, uh, No, I'm not 30 so I'm way older than that but we will no longer be immature like children let me tell you something one of the worst things that you can do is to act like a child when you're supposed to be a spiritual adult God is wanting to grow us up to the place that we aren't like children where we're embarrassed about things like sharing our faith. Where we're all shy about stuff. Let me tell you something. God has set you free. I believe we've got to get out of the boat. Amen. God has called you to a ministry. We need to get out of the boat. It says we won't be tossed and blown. This is important. He says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my church. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave heaven. I'm going to come to this earth. I'm going to train up the disciples. And I'm going to leave apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors. I'm going to leave them behind for the perfecting of the saints. I'm going to do this for the work of the ministry. Then I'm going to send them out. They're going to teach, teach people to be mature in Christ, to know the word of God, to live the word of God, to become all God has for them. Why? Because I don't want them to be immature children. And then most in a very important, I don't want them to be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching and every false doctrine that comes along. The day we live in now says, oh, what do people say about us all the time? You know what? God don't mind if you do this or you do that. It's okay if you go here, you go. It's okay if you do this a little bit. It's all right. You know what? Just skip church today. Just be, do whatever you want. Don't read your Bible today. It's okay. You don't have to memorize scripture. You don't have to be crazy like your parents were and actually pray for real miracles. It's okay. Winds of false doctrine coming around in our life saying that God is a God of total grace. He'll forgive everything. Don't worry about it. Sin all you want. Just, you know what? It's under the blood of Jesus. It's under the grace of God. You just do whatever you want to do. Live your life however you want to live and it'll all be okay. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Do I sin? Yes, I do. Do I keep sinning the same sins? I sure try not to. Right? But see, God, I don't think I'm separated from God every time I sin. That's not the point. The point is if I just go, oh, well, God's grace will take care of it. It doesn't matter. That's a problem. Make, make sense? So the, the, the thing is that we get, 
You got to understand those are false doctrines. And when people speak things into your life and say, well, church doesn't save you. Duh. Say something <laughs> intelligent, would you? <ya? laughs> <laughs> Jesus saves us. Amen. Amen. And, and me going and saying the right prayer and, 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 and kneeling and standing and, and doing all the exercises that we, we do at church, that doesn't save us. It doesn't save us to do all this. We are saved through the blood of Jesus, asking Him to forgive us of our sins and following Him and surrendering our lives every day to Him. That's how we're saved. Amen. But it says, don't be tossed around by all the weird stuff you're taught all the time. You've got to get strong. And it's the job of the pastor and leaders to train people how to be strong so that you will not be tossed around. And then it goes on and says, and we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever. Aren't the lies clever that we hear in this world today? The clever lies. How many of you even have tried to lie to yourself before? I try to lie to myself, tell myself something, because why? I want to do something or go somewhere, whatever. I want to do that, and I try to influence myself. And I'm like, ah, that ain't right. Why? Because I have the Bible. I have the wisdom, the knowledge. The pastors taught us our preaching and word and things. We know it's not right. Amen? Amen. So don't be tossed around by all this teaching. Don't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies, the clever things. They sound like the truth. Instead, instead, we will speak the truth in love. Hallelujah. I love that. We will speak the truth in love. It's one of the trickiest things the devil does in our lives. And actually, God tells us we're the, we're the ones that have all the knowledge and we're so good. We do it all right. And those people out there, they do it all wrong and they're all bad. We can just tell them, you shouldn't live that way. That's wrong for you to do. You know what? That's not right. You shouldn't handle it that way. I can't believe you ugly person. You would do that. Judgmental spirit. But God says we speak the truth in love. Well, I loved him when I told him. I loved him so much I told him. If I didn't love him, I wouldn't tell him they're going to hell. You better turn or you're going to burn. No, that's not right. God says we need to love. Amen? Growing in every way. I love this part. He's saying, you instead of being all that, we will speak the truth in love. We will be growing in every way. Growing in every way. Not... Not, not, not a meandering in the maze of mediocrity, but growing constantly every day, becoming more like Christ, being truthful followers of Christ every day, being in a relationship with him every day. Hallelujah. We will continually growing up in every way, more and more like Christ. Hallelujah. Circle in your Bible. Who is the head of the body, the church? He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does his own work. So he's saying, so it's like this progression of things that are happening here. Jesus started with one, just himself, born as a baby. The most, the most simple thing you could ever imagine. A little baby being born in the city of Bethlehem in the middle of a, of a, of a barn. And, and some, some shepherds show up and... So some, some wise men show up and give some gifts and, and all of a sudden he grows up and he's becoming, he's teaching his word to 12 disciples and a few others around and all of a sudden he's spreading himself to, to, to everyone and then he leaves himself with the, with the, uh, the 12 disciples in the New Testament church and the breakup of the Holy Spirit coming out on all of them and then all of a sudden his word just is spreading until now there are some 2 billion Christians on the face of the earth. Amen. Amen. And there are billions more have went already to be with him. Amen? Amen? Powerful, isn't it? And how does this happen? He let the gifts of the teachers and the preachers and the pastors and the apostles and the prophets. He left them to teach and then he left the people to receive it and to learn and then walk in it. And to get mature where they don't get blown around and get caught off guard and, and, get, uh, and get bitter and hateful toward the church and, and, and selfish, right? The body working together in unity. I love that about Great Life Church. It's a church of unity. We fight for unity, amen? amen? That means we don't pick apart each other. We take care of our own responsibilities and we encourage others if they fall down and we help pick them up. But we don't, da, da, did you hear about da, 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 da. We don't do that around here. I don't hear that hardly at all here. 
That's good. But anyway, I can't get stuck there. The whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So this whole thing is happening. And where are we at in this process right now? We are the body that is healthy. We should be growing every day. We should not be stagnant. Why? Because he's trying to perfect us. He said he sent the gifts to us. The pastor, teacher, prophet, evangelist, apostle. What? For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. My job as a pastor and the other pastor leaders is for us to perfect the saints, to get you the knowledge, the information, the path, the understanding of where you need to go and how you get there in order to grow up and become all God. God wants you to be. That is our goal. And, and, and in essence, that is the plan of God. To be perfected means, in the Greek word there, I don't, I don't always go into it, but it's translated that we be perfected means it be finished, it be complete, having reached an end of the process. And, and what I want to talk to you today is living up means or tuning up on a regular basis takes what? What does tuning up do? What is my job as the pastor to prepare you that you can walk in the perfection of the saints and in the work of the ministry? How do I accomplish that? How do I teach you the things you need to know? How do I help you understand the stuff you need? How do the other teachers in the church help you to get the knowledge that you need? I believe it happens through you having a consistent tune-up in your life. You've got to know some things. What, how, how does a tune-up happen? Where, where does it place? And I believe it goes back to the things that I've talked about before. I believe that is why I use the ABCs of spiritual maturity. Because why? I believe for you to make it where you need to be, what, is, what does a tune-up consist of? How can you constantly be tuned up? Number one, you need to, number, number one, you need to know the truth. You need to know the truth. You need to know the plan. You need to know the goal. What is the goal? What am I supposed to look up, look like as a spiritually mature follower of Christ? What am I supposed to look like as this fully mature Christian? What is it supposed to look like? And I believe sometimes we can look at the entire Bible and we get lost in it and we don't quite know what does the truth mean. So number one, you've got to know what the goal is. You've got to know what the plan is. If you're going to tune something up, you've got to know what running smoothly is. Everybody knows the car that's broke down on the side of the road is not running smoothly. Right? But how do you know a car is running smoothly? How do you know it is tuned up? How do you know that it is doing right? Well, you just know. You hit the gas pedal, it takes off. You hit the brakes, it stops. It doesn't miss. Da, 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 da. It doesn't knock when you turn a corner. Anybody ever had that happen? I was, my son said, it was knocking when you turn it. And I, I'm like, you got a bad axle, son. Well, you have to replace an axle, right? See, the point is that you know stuff's broken, stuff's out of place. And you know what? Many times we know things are broken and out of place, but we put our heads in the sand and ignore it. I've done that before, too. But you've got to know what is right, what the baseline is, right? You've got to start with knowing what the goal is. You've got to know what, is, what, 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 what do we as Christians need to measure ourselves against. It's my job, it's the job of other pastors, other leaders, to know that information. To know the stuff so I can share with you. Now I know I'm moving very slow here. Because I'm wanting you to understand really clearly that, that there is a roadmap. There is a plan. It is found in the Bible. And I keep my Bible here right now. And I got plenty of them right over here in that room next door. But the point is that the, 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 the Bible is the roadmap. And what I have, I have done and others leaders have done and other pastors is I have taken and I've said to you that if you follow the, the ABCs of spiritual maturity, that you will grow up, that you can do constant tune-ups, that you can know what you're supposed to be doing, what you're supposed to be about, and how you will grow up. It is not just some cliche about that I try to give to you. It's not just some sermon so I can fill some week up with some sermon. It is that me trying to be... Me trying to be responsible to God with the people that he's given to me. Because I know the Bible's complicated sometimes. And I know Christianity. And I know there's a lot of whispering out there. So I boil it down to these seven habits and say, if you will do these things, it will give you what you need to become the true follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. Every day, through every trial, through every standing boat, 
and being willing to jump out of the boat. And then get a glimpse of what God has called you to. And then learning how to go to that fullness of what God has called you to. The process. If you will follow and consistently do a checkup in your life against the ABCs of spiritual maturity, you will grow up and become all that God wants you to be. Amen? Amen. So I've asked you to memorize them. I've went through an entire series. One time I went through a seven-week series teaching you these things. Who wants to stand up and quote them to me? The ABC. No, I, I can't even do it sometimes. I'm not trying to, to put anybody on the spot. Let's call out Ben. Come on, Ben, you can do it. Come on. Okay. <laughs> Pastor, that's right. He knows the A. He said, attend church. Well, let me tell you be something. Friend. If you're going to, there you go. Be a friend of sinners. He's working his way there. Who knows what C is? <laughs> See, I've written down. Huh? Connect. connect. There you go. It's connecting believers. There you go. See, D. Daily time. Look at her go. One of the newest converts in this church. Daily time with God. See, you know, sometimes when you start out new, you kind of learn everything you're supposed to, and then when you get old, you forget. <laughs> D. Daily time with God. How about E? Every believer a minister. There you go. Every believer a minister. So every believer has a ministry. Right? We all do. We're called by God to do something. Why? Because you've got to have an outflow or you're going to get stagnant and stinky. If you just keep coming, feed me, pastor. Feed me. Just a fat little baby. I want my <laughs> bottle and I don't mean maybe. You guys know that song? An old Amy Grant song. Anyway. <laughs> Talking about a spiritual fat little baby that comes to church, puts the bottle in her mouth, and drinks the bottle. I don't, you know, I want my bottle in. I don't mean feed me, Pastor. Feed me. I don't want to study for myself. I don't want to read for myself. And you go, man, that pastor don't ever teach me anything. That church, you know, it ain't got good worship, it ain't got good preaching, it ain't got this, it ain't got that. I'm out of here. You know what I mean? Because you're just a fat little baby. You want your bottle and you don't mean maybe. Feed me, feed me, feed me. I sing good. Move over, Amy Grant. <laughs> I don't know. I'm making a fool of myself today. I've got my wife. I started saying it. Why not? Because you're like, oh, you embarrass me. No. <laughs> No, I'm teasing. My point is, guys, that we don't want to be like that. We don't want to be all consuming, all selfish. It's about us and what we want, how we want things done. You need to, you need to, you need to drink God's milk yourself at home and study. So daily time, E every Christian. F, what's the F? Fellowship. Fellowship. Oh, we already said that one. Connect. So it can't be that again. But good try, though. Focus on the fruit. Come on, come on, Pastor Gene. Hey, Pastor Gene, who do you think the A plus student is in the in the house today? <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> he whined. He whined for a month when we were in Grenada because some teacher gave him a, a B minus or something like that. I was like, man, he whined and whined and whined about it. B plus. A B plus. I apologize. <laughs> it was his only B plus ever in college. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing him. It was the, the teacher did something wrong though. But anyway, it wasn't about the fault he Yes, of course. So the point is that yeah, I appreciate Pastor Gene telling me focus on the fruits of the spirit. Why do I say the fruits of the spirit? Because I believe the fruits of the spirit are the are, are so important. I'm going to talk a little more about those later. But the fruits of the spirit are love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, meekness, patience. Right? Be faith. Things that God wants to be in our life. The fruit that shows that we're a believer. And the G is give there. You go. Give faithfully. Giving is a lifestyle. That's exactly right. Okay. Good job. See, why are these things important? These things are important because they lead you to other things in your spiritual life. They lead you to other things. If you're not attending church regularly or faithfully, then you, you don't have the opportunities that come to you because you go to church. When you go to church, you get time with other believers. You learn the Bible. You, you, you get people to love on you. When you're going through a hard time, they put their arm around you and hug you. People accept you unconditionally. There's so much that happens in church. It goes on and on and on. 
I'm going to be closing here in a few minutes. I'm not dealing with all those. And so it begins with knowing the truth or knowing the path, knowing the baseline, knowing what it takes to grow up. Now, do you have to do all those things perfectly? Absolutely not. It could be on a rating system. Maybe you attend church and you're a nine attending church. Every time the doors are open, you're here, you're there. That's great. Or maybe you're a three at attending church and you need to get a little bit better at it. Isn't that? The point is that, that whatever that is, or maybe you come, but you really don't get involved. You don't get out of the boat and worship a little. You don't get out of the boat and amen once in a while. You don't get out of the boat and offer to help and assist in some way. Right? You need to grow a little in that. Or maybe, you know, being a friend of the lost or the sinners. Maybe you're a friend as far as being kind to them and, 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 being, and helping them if they need help. But maybe you're not kind because you never ask them if they want to go to heaven. You're going to let them go to hell. I don't know if that's a real friend or not. Is it a real friend to let somebody go to hell? Without ever even mentioning or offering what you have? No, that's not a friend. <laughs> Boy, that was tough, wasn't it? So the point is that you may not be perfect. You may be a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You can evaluate. So the second step to the process of doing tune-ups in your life, the first step is to know the truth. Because the truth, Know what the goal is. Know what the baseline. Know what you're trying to accomplish. Use the A, B, C, D, E, F as the baseline. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Then the second part is that you need to do a checkup once in a while. If you're going to do a tune-up, you need to do a checkup. Got to check yourself up a little bit. You got to check it out a little bit. Evaluate yourself. Be true to yourself. Be honest. Don't lie to yourself. Look at it for real. Be, I call it being brutally honest with yourself. Being truthful and honest and saying, you know what? I've been having this problem. I've been, I've been, I've been coveting things that other people have. I, I've, been, I've been showing hatred. I've been mad and angry too much. I, I've lusted too much over this and that. I, I have found myself cussing too much. I, I find myself, you know, uh, not, not, not wanting to go to church. I go still, but I don't really want to be there. I find, you know what I mean? You check up. says, I got to check myself and say, what is going on? You know, on a consistent basis. And we start to slide back a little bit. Stop the slide early. Amen? That's why they say, once you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. That's why they said, I don't believe that. I don't, I don't profess that. But I understand what they're saying. I believe Jesus can set you free. And you, want, and you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And old stuff passes away and everything becomes all new, right? Amen. That's what I believe. I believe I've seen people come in drunk and lay hands on, they be completely sober and leave and never want another drink. And I believe that. But I also understand why they're saying that. They're saying you need to be absolute. If you were a, had a problem with drinking, you should tell yourself, I better never even have a drop of it. And most of them won't even use NyQuil because it has too much in it. But the point is that they don't even take a drop of alcohol. Why? Because they know they'll slide right back. And so they say, uh, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. I can't take a chance. If I try a little bit of it, I'll go too far. I'll start slipping back. It'll be bad in my life. So I can't even give an inch because the devil will take a mile. Okay, I get that. And yes, I want you to take that perspective in life. When you see yourself start sliding backwards, you know what? You, you, you skip a service. Uh, you, you skip church. You, you, it's an easy one to pick on because it's number one. But let's say the daily time of God. You, you don't read your Bible one day. You got in a hurry. You got up late. You missed the alarm clock, whatever. And you're going and you're trying to make up. Sure, you try it. You slip back fine. You slip back a little. Just pray on the way to work then that day. But next day, get right back to it. Don't go, you know, it worked out okay. I prayed on the way to work. I didn't have to actually get up and spend a little time with God. You're slipping backwards, slipping backwards, slipping back. No, go back. Catch the slide early. Amen? Amen. Mm. I took too long on the other stuff, so I can't use all my stuff here. But I want you to catch this slide. So you need to evaluate on a regular basis. Number one, you need to go the plan, the baseline, the goal. Number two, you need to evaluate on a consistent basis. You need to look at what's working, what's not working, and what's missing. That's part of the evaluation. You've heard me say that before. You know what's working in your life. You know what's good, going good in your life. You know what makes you blessed in your life. That's what's working. You also know what's not working. That area's broken. That heart's messed up. I know that needs to be fixed. Then you also need to be con consistently aware that there are things that are missing. What is the missing part? The missing part sometimes is the most important part. Because the missing part, you don't even know what that is. You've heard me say this before, right? You, you know what's working. I know that I know how to play the piano, right? Well, I don't really know how to play it well, but I do kind of know how to play the piano. I know how to play the guitar better. So I know I know how to play the guitar. But I also know that I don't know how to play the trumpet. I don't know how to play the trumpet, right? So I know what I know, and I know what I don't know. The important thing is always understand 
that there are things that you don't even know that you don't even know. Right? There are things you don't even know that you don't even know. In other words, there are things you don't even know that you don't even know that you don't even know the questions that you've asked in order to know what you don't even know because you don't even know what to ask. <laughs> no, I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> you can't know what you don't know that you need to know until somebody tells you that you need to know this stuff. Amen. That's why you go to church. So sometimes you'll hear things that you don't even know that you didn't even know you needed to know. But now you know that you needed to know it and you wish you would have known it earlier, right? Yeah. Is that all good? Is it like, yeah. is that clear? Yeah. All right. So the only way you can know things that you don't even know that you didn't even know, know that you needed to know is by praying, letting the Holy Spirit tell you things that you didn't even know that you didn't even know, right? Holy Spirit's revealed things many times to me out of the Bible that I didn't even know that I didn't know. And now I know that I didn't know. <laughs> right? And you come to church, you hear me preach sometimes, and you... Huh? Who's on first? Who's on first? Yes. <laughs> well, I don't know who's on third, though. Right? The point I'm trying to make to you is that you've got to understand you don't know it all, and I don't expect you to know it all, and I don't know it all. Nobody knows it all except for Jesus himself knows it all. But I'm telling you, if you get around people and hang out with believers, that's why it's important to fellowship with other believers. That's why it's important to read the Bible. That's why it's important to pray. Let the Holy Spirit teach you. Go to church. Learn things that you didn't even know that you didn't even know. But evaluation is about knowing what you know, knowing what you don't know, and being willing to be open to the Holy Spirit to teach you about things you didn't even know that you needed to know. Amen. Amen. Whew. All right. Number three, and that's the final one. So number one, you need to know the baseline. You need to know where you're headed. You need to know that you need to be like Christ, right? Fully, uh, a fully devoted follower of Christ. So how do you get there? Number two, you evaluate your life constantly, whether or not you're lining up, majoring up, doing the right thing, what's missing, what's not missing, what's going good. You're evaluating. And number three is you need to go, you need to realize that you need to continue to reach up high and make the changes that need to be made. You need to reach up. Amen? Amen. You need to go up to the new levels. If you are staying where you're at all the time and you're not growing and thriving, if you're not going further up into the ABCs to spiritual maturity, if you're not moving up even in individual levels. I say I, I do all of these things on a regular basis. Every one of these are working in my life, okay? Because I believe in them. How did I come up with these? I come up with these, yes, other people teach other things. I, you know, Rick Warren teaches about the habits and other ones teach about other things. There are other ones out there. And, and, but I, I look at these things and when my first church, not my first church, my second church that I pastored, the first church had nobody in it. The second church started. The second church had some people in it, some mature people that had been Christians for 50 years. And I looked at their life and I asked them and interviewed them. I said, what do you do to stay safe so long? How do you live a, that kind of life? Now some of them I would have never wanted their advice because they were pretty messed up even though they've been church 50 years. You know what I mean? Other ones had it right and I wanted to know what it was. And I took my own spirit and said, what's the Bible say about it? How did people grow up? What does the Bible say are the foundational things? These are the things that I saw were foundational in people's lives that made it through life and, and were followed, fully devoted followers of Christ. Praise God. So I don't do them all perfectly, but we want to, you know, we want to work on them. So are you progressing forward in the fruits of the spirit? Are you letting love completely follow you? Are, do you got joy in your life? Joy doesn't have anything to do with happiness. You got the joy, or you sometimes, you know, I fall into depression. I'll be sad about something. And I don't even know why I'm sad. Anybody else there? there? Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, God, this really isn't what you want for me. How can I, how can I find the joy? And I've been there. I know. This ain't right. I shouldn't feel this way. There's really no reason for me, for one. And two, the Holy Spirit, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I'm supposed to have joy in my heart. And it's okay. Be honest. Deal with it. Amen? Amen. That's what I'm trying to say. That's how this stuff works in practice. You're going to go to the next level. Am I progressing? Am I going higher? Am I moving up? Am I fixing up the things that are broke? Am I reaching up to the new levels God has for me? See, the third part is to fix or change that which is broken and to move up beyond it, to in, beyond even that which is missing and add all of that to your life. At least start knowing the right thing to do and work on it. Amen? Amen. And so this is why I wanted you, I really wanted to get into why. I want us in this church to start taking the, the ABCs of spiritual maturity more seriously. It is, a, it is a taking of the Bible and my, and my life experience and other people's life experience and putting it into something that is easily understood that you can have actionable plans to accomplish. 
And each one of them will lead you to whole worlds of blessing in your life. Amen. The easy one to see is the A, go to church, right? You can see how that opens up to whole worlds, blessings coming into your life. The daily time of God, that's easy to see how the blessings can come into your life. When you start getting the giving as a lifestyle, ooh. Yeah, no. Blessings can come into your life. Being a friend to sinners. Blessings into your life. Amen? Amen. Jesus made it very clear. You are to be the light of the world. Jesus made it very clear that the, 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 the well do not need a physician. The sick needed it. That's why he hung out with the, 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 the wine bibber sometimes and the prostitutes. All right, in conclusion, God has called us to do these things. So come on. I want us to continue to really focus on these things. Learn them. Next week, I will be bringing more stuff and we're going to be posting them in a, in a place in the church and we're going to post them in a more visible place on a regular basis. You can see them. They'll be available to you in paper form. I want you guys to take and put, cut them if you have to, to make the size of your Bible, put them in your Bible. Keep these things and ask yourself, Constantly and constantly tune up yourself and say, I know what I should, how I should be running on all of my cylinders. I know what that looks like. And, and I'm going to evaluate on a regular basis and I'm going to see if I'm doing those things. And then thirdly, I'm going to make the changes I need to make and I'm going to rise up to where God has planned for me. I'm trying to give you the tools. Why? Because I'm responsible. All of us pastors, all of us here, we're responsible for God to continue what God started way back when Jesus came to this earth in a baby. And when he started, we are continuing by the gifts God gave to this church. We want to be gifts to you. And that's why I constantly talk about this and preach about this. I'd rather preach the running, shunning, shouting, spinning sermon, all happy and excited. But today, God is saying to you, it's time to do regular tune-ups in your life. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand to our feet today.